Welcome to today's episode of 100 Days of Magic. I am so glad that you are here. I'm talking slowly because I just wanted to make sure it was actually going live. It's open to humans or whatever else you call yourself in the world. Someday I don't feel very human, that is for sure. And I look around and go, how did I get here? So welcome back to our 100 day exploration of habit. Not only is I am I coming here to help you learn a few tidbits about the magical practice you might not have considered before, but I'm also holding open a space for all of you to start a new habit. Because ultimately, living a life of magic in tune with the cycles of the seasons, in tune with your divine spark within, is a habit. Just like any other habit that we create for ourselves, whether it is, I don't know, brushing your teeth or doing your dishes or going to the gym, all those things are habits that we learn by muscle memory that shape the way we see the world. Magic is the same thing. If you want to live a more magical life, and that's the number one thing everyone tells me they want to do, you have to make it a habit to begin to plug yourself into spirit. Realize that your body is just the temple, the holder for the divine spark that you carry within you, and have that infuse everything in your life that you do. So hello, Boris. Hello, Christine. Hello, Claudia. I think all of you have been here just about every day and we are on day six. So I want to applaud you, you and me all showing up together. And I hope some of the rest of you know there's eh, a little over 10,000 people in this group listening to this broadcast right now. I hope some of you will also do yourself a favor and make a promise to yourself to make a little bit of time every day to tune into spirit and then fan those flames so that you realize every moment of every day becomes an opportunity for you express more spirit in the physical world okay so let's get on to the content of today's magical reflection we're going to be talking about tarot as kabbalah's graphic novel now, first of all, I hope you all know what a graphic novel is. A graphic novel is kind of like a sophisticated comic book. Lots of pictures, few little words, but the pictures are what carry the story. And in essence, that's what Kabbalah, that's what the tarot has become for the Kabbalah. So if you're not familiar with tarot, let's go back to the very beginning. Tarot is a Renaissance card game, kind of like bridge. Uh, the first available decks that we have discovered date back to like, yeah, eh, more or less 1420, 1440, just depends on who you ask. But the images that, that are in tarot for those first hundred years or so fluctuated a bit. They were influenced by all kinds of things that were popular at the time. They were influenced by Christian mysticism, they were influenced by alchemy, they were influenced by astrology, and yes, they were influenced by Kabbalah. They were also influenced by whoever happened to be doing the art on the cards, whatever family commissioned the project. Tarot cards were first really works of art for some very wealthy families in the uh, Italian Renaissance region where they, they were, where they were created. So, but there was no one true tarot in the beginning. Cards flipped around, that fifth suit that made them tarot, that fifth suit of images, uh, varied from place to place. Sometimes they had more cards, sometimes they had fewer cards. It really wasn't until the French card making industry, because there was becoming an industry in the Renaissance era of making all kinds of games mass produced because the printing press was invented in you know, the middle of the 1400s. So as these cards were becoming mass produced, you needed to have a template for what the cards would look like. And so they ended up with 22 cards and some decks, 
for the tarot. Well, it really wasn't until the late 1700s when a French scholar uh, who loved all kinds of primitive magic wrote a, wrote a little piece talking about how there were 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Therefore, there should be 22 letters in the trump cards of the tarot so there could be a one-to-one -one significance between the two of them. Because anybody who has gone deeply into the study of Kabbalah realizes that the Kabbalistic system is based on around the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. That's an oversimplification, but still the point remains. Direct relationship between what tarot should be theoretically and the Kabbalah. Fast forward a few hundred years, and as occultists continue to study and get involved in the tarot as a divination tool, not just a game, as a tool for doing magic, the cards were slowly over time retrofitted to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with the model of that divine, the divine interaction into a physical plane as exemplified by the Kabbalah. So that every major arcana card became emblematic of one of the paths that connect between the different energy centers on the Kabbalah and the and the eventually with the creation of the Rider Waite Smith deck. Um, Pamela Coleman Smith finished the job and made sure all of the minor arcana cards, all the pip cards were also related to the various stages of world creation as defined in Kabbalah. So in a very real way, this exists in the way it is today because of Kabbalah. So even if you're someone who's using these cards just to learn how to tune into yourself, super useful. But when you realize that these cards are really based on a very, very ancient map of consciousness, of how we become embodied, how we bring energy down into physicality. I shouldn't drop them on the floor. Hold on. How we bring our energy down into physicality and how we raise our energies up so that we are able to connect to that divine spark within us. Once we realize they are that kind of map, you notice that whenever you draw a spread for yourself on tarot, you aren't just telling a story for you to interpret. You're actually laying out a map of the terrain, your inner psychic terrain, and putting a big old signpost that says, you are here. And if you know all the other things that those are connected to, your tarot takes on a whole new layer of significance. You instantaneously know if you're working on a problem that is rooted in ah, maybe how your thoughts relate to your emotions or how you are embodying your emotions, or maybe it's something deeper than that. Maybe you are working on a, on a problem that's much more deeply rooted in your subconscious experience. Maybe it shows you in the ways that you are blocking your manifestation of that divine spark within you. And in what ways? Maybe things that have even come on over from other lives and other experiences, and they give you an opportunity to figure out how to shift those energy flows, which when you shift the energy flows on a higher level of something, can have much bigger impacts than when you try to shift the energy flows of something on a lower level. Because you are, when you change the template, everything that it's connected to starts to shift and change as well. So that's your history lesson for today. But that comes back to understanding what these cards are. They are, in my personal opinion, and in many of your own opinions, probably the best tool that Western magic has ever created to help our overly intellectual, talky brains begin to take steps to open the doorway to speak to our divine spark within us. If you have not done extensive dream work, if you feel uncomfortable with channeling, if you don't understand how people feel like they're getting messages from the divine all the time and you are looking for a place to start, this is your best bet because this is the tip of the iceberg that is aligned with 
all of the other things in the magical tradition. So at least if you know if you're using these, you are speaking the same language as all the other things in the Western tradition that you might want to pick up along the way, if you understand what these actually are. And you don't need to have all that backstory. You don't need to know the Kabbalah in order to read these cards well. You do need to begin to learn how to tell a story. These are pictures like a graphic novel. A graphic novel is a narrative. Now, way before, way before I was doing magic as a professional thing. So when I say way before, I mean, I've been doing magic professionally for like 20 years, 20 some odd years now. So it's been a long time. But before that, um, when I was in graduate school, one of my master's degrees is in uh, journalism and communications. And one of the things we learned over and over again in journalism school is that humans are narrative creatures. We find meaning through the stories we tell ourselves. Who did what to where, to, to whom and where and how, and all those things give our lives meaning. So if you want to change what the world means to you, you have to change your story. You have to change the narrative that you keep telling yourself in order to change what things mean to you. And the beauty of the tarot cards is because they're all made out of images. When you realize that they're images that are just trying to tell you a story, that's how they become the ideal tool for connecting with your deeper self. Because it's, it's the language that you have in common with your inner psyche, with your higher self, whatever you want to call it, is those molecules of story. And once you begin to trust, as you lay out the cards, you are tapping into a moment of divination when you connect to your inner self. All kinds of amazing things begin to happen. You begin to feel like you are speaking with the cards. And when you are speaking with the cards, you recognize they are just a useful intermediary for teaching, for talking to that divine within you. Now, the Rider Waite Smith deck is the pivotal deck of the modern era. It's the deck that the uh, the artist Pamela Coleman Smith went and researched at the at the British Museum, uh, got some input from the Golden Dawn folks, and brought hundreds of years of Kabbalistic studies. Western magic into the deck on purpose. And most decks that we have today that are tarot decks, meaning they have, you know, 78 cards, 22 major arcana, plus the, all the minor arcana cards, are based off of this. Even if the artists have made different decisions on how they draw the images, um, even if they made different choices on what they might mean, they still filter through the lens of this almost all of them. So it doesn't matter so much which particular deck you particularly like to use. This may not be your favorite for various reasons, although we all must recognize the historic, the great historical significance of what Pamela Coleman Smith did. Uh, she's finally got a, uh, Kathy Beale told me she's finally got a, uh, uh, an exhibit in uh, New York City Museum off of all the tarot cards in her work, which I think is totally awesome. Um, but even if you're not using this one, even if this, you know, art style doesn't appeal to you and you like something that's more dramatic or maybe you like cats, maybe you like an iconographic picture. It doesn't matter what style you like. If they're close to this, you already know you are 100% tapping into a larger tradition. And you can learn how to make consulting with these cards a daily ritual, a regular ritual that you are honoring your connection with spirit and using them as a way to directly connect and, oh, and begin to open the doors. The thing about opening the doors is once you open the doors in one place, they are easier to open in other places. 
for some of us who grew up in a very overly intellectual world, it's scary taking those first steps. We don't know how, or it took me years to like tarot cards. I'm like, I don't get it. Why would anybody want to use these? I want to go do something else. This is hard. And I'd always be looking up the, um, looking up the little white book that comes with it to try to figure out what it means. And I still didn't get it. It took forever. But once I really got how these were interlaced with everything else I was learning, they became my, one of my all time favorite tools. You know, we're all slow. Some of us are fast learners in some places. Some of us are slow learners in others. I always tell people that my personal guides have to drag me kicking and screaming most of the time because I seem to find all the wrong ways to do something before I actually hit on something that works. So <laughs> I do not berate yourself if you haven't gotten into being able to use these yet. But I highly recommend that you take another look because using them regularly open the doors in ways that most other things can't, okay? So, if you've got any questions about tarot, feel free to stick them in the comments of this post. I'd love to continue the conversation with you. If you know you're really ready to dive deep and you like the way I talk about it, I also have a 16-week uh, course that is a deep dive into tarot. All you need to do is go to www.magicandmastery.com tarot and find out more about the 16-week course. We do meditations on all the cards. I tell you where each one comes from. We go into their iconography. I mean, it's a graduate level course on tarot. Even people who studied the tarot for years go like, wow, I learned more than I ever knew before. Come check it out. But more than anything, just pick up a deck and start to play. Because ultimately, the way you have a conversation between you and, and your higher self is based on you and who you are. Okay? All right, a few questions before I go. Um, let's see. Uh, Alfie says, how are Lenormand or other Oracle decks related to Kabbalah? Uh, excellent question, Alfie. Um, I, I also love the Lenormand cards. The Lenormand are not tied to Kabbalah. That's actually what makes the difference between tarot and Oracle decks. They're not they're not graphic novels of the Kabbalah. However, any kind of oracle system that you are using on a regular basis will grease the wheels, so to speak, in your conversation with your higher self. The only difference is they don't give you the same kind of plug into the map of Kabbalah once you understand what the map of Kabbalah is, you know, the various layers of your, of your soul self, your higher self, how your higher self relates to the divine, um, whether you're on the, um, the side that has to do with strength and manifestation, or if you're on the side that has to do with force and creative urge and everything in between, there's a big sophisticated map. So it doesn't plug into that in the same way, but that doesn't mean they're not worth using. Uh, Christine asks, can you comment on what is written in the book versus intuitively received? Okay. Once you, when you're first beginning learning anything and you feel unsure, it's really common for us to feel like we are tied to the descriptions in the book. We want to do it right, especially if you're a Virgo and I can speak to all Virgos here since I am one. You want to do it right and you feel like if you get something else you should discount it because it's not in the little white book let me get i know there's a little white book in here somewhere this thing is like 40 years old this is really old deck it's falling apart even the cards are getting yellow i can't believe i still have it um so these little white books that come with them if you open them up let me see if i can find a description um, all right so here's a description for Ten cups. I'm looking for okay. Here's the descriptions for the major arcana card. Can you see that? They're tiny. They're like one or two sentences each. In my lessons, my descriptions of the major arcana cards take me 20 minutes to go through per card. I'm sure there are books down here on the shelf. Um, let me see if I can find a big one. All right, here. We go. Meditations on tarot. This one's written by a, an author on the Christian tarot. There are 
oh, 40 or 50 pages per major arcana tarot card. So you could probably write a whole book on these themes that go into one card. So if you feel like, oh wait, it's not in the little right book, it must not be true, you are missing the fact that this is just a tiny little sliver of the universe that you can look through. And your intuition is filtering this information in a totally different way. Our intuitions are the way we, we plug into the infinite of the cosmos and lets us see a lot more, especially if we tune into how we feel, how we perceive, our gut feelings. We learn how to listen to them and we really begin to appreciate comparing our intuition to our experience and learning which parts of our intuition are divinely inspired by that spark within us versus which parts of our intuition are just our fears projecting into the world, which parts are true and which parts are just continuing false narratives, which takes, I mean, that's a practice in and of itself, learning how to do that. You don't just flip a switch. We can learn how to trust that our intuition is going to take us beyond what the, is physically on the cards. Sometimes the cards are just a jumping off point. And I think anybody who's read tarot or other kinds of divination tools for a long time knows what that feels like. First, they're talking about the cards, and then they realize that whatever their own unique way of connecting to spirit is, mine's usually auditory, but other people's might be different. You see things and you feel things and you hear things that are beyond what's on there because you're just starting the journey. But that doesn't mean that the cards and these little books aren't a great starting place. They're just the starting place. They're not the ending place. So, Christine, I hope you, I answered that. Uh, Jackie says, another course of yours that I got partway through and then was really enjoying it and then life got in the way. Kabbalah and tarot need to both be first on my to resume list as soon as things get set up. I highly agree. I, I also have a 12-week course on Kabbalah. Um, it's just at magicandmastery.com slash Kabbalah. Uh, I have links for both of them here in the, uh, the Crossroads group. So you can find them in the course sections and I've also pinned them. You can think of Kabbalah and tarot's relationship in two ways. Either Kabbalah is advanced tarot because it teaches you the theories, the spiritual theories that go into why the cards have the images that they do. It's, it's a great place to deepen your understanding and it adds a whole new layer you haven't thought about before. Or you can think about tarot as practical Kabbalah. Kabbalah by itself is a giant filing cabinet that shows you how astrology is connected to tarot and, and tarot is connected to alchemy and all of that's connected to mysticism that, and how all the pieces fit together. But it's still more of a theoretical construct on its own unless you are meditating along each of the paths. If you are meditating on each of the paths, you are meditating on, on tarot cards because when these images were created, they were created to be meditation tools for exploring the Kabbalah kind of like the stations of the Kabbalah, so to speak. For all those Catholics out there, you know what I'm talking about. So I highly recommend that you at least start with some kind of divination tool if you haven't already, because it truly is the easiest way forward for most people, especially the people who are overly intellectual. And accept that you're probably going to be frustrated at first and like feel awkward at first. But once it clicks in what you're actually working with, really, it will supercharge all of your other psychic practices in ways that are hard to describe. But I've seen it so many times. I mean, I've had, I have like two or 3,000 of my students on my mailing list. I have seen the transformation happen so many times. I, I, even when you are particularly in it yourself, you're like, oh my God, this is never going to happen to me. 
from my perspective, when I've seen it happen, so many people have said that, including myself, and then yet it happens anyway. I have utter faith in the ability of the cosmos to recognize we have all this technology, this ability built into our psyches already. So under the right circumstances, with the right consistent practice, making it a habit, you can go in places you never imagined were possible. Uh, Baros asks, is it cool to do the classes simultaneously? Uh, yes. Um, I have tarot and Kabbalah set up, and there's an option to do both courses simultaneously if you would like to. Um, each course gives you about an hour a week of content and homework, but in the case of tarot and Kabbalah, there's so much overlap between the two of them. Um, not that it's the same material, it's all presented in a different way. You're not going to feel totally lost and overwhelmed. It'd be like a real intensive because you're going to have two hours of material to watch every week and homework for them, but at least they complement one another. Same thing goes for my planetary magic courses. I have two of them. Um, planetary magic one is all about connecting to each one of the planets as divine spirits. Planetary magic two is about using that knowledge and learning how to create astrology charts. They're also designed to be taken together if you wanted to, because they exercise different parts of your brain. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Claudia says, I finished the tarot course, but I will have to revisit it again. There is still so much to learn that I may have missed the first time. Yes. I, they really are graduate courses in magic. Um, I, I love the chance to be able to do a real deep dive into something. And yeah, I, I have two master's degrees and I kind of miss graduate school and I always thought it'd be fun to like go to, you know, the graduate version of Hogwarts. <laughs> so since it doesn't exist, I am just making one myself. <laughs> um, Jackie says, I love, love the planetary magic courses. Is that how you say that when you have like L U and a bunch of these love the planetary magic courses? We'll talk about them this week. We're going to talk about astrology and it's, in its place in the magical world. So I am way over time this time. Thank you so much for asking your questions. You know, I love questions. Um, I actually have, I hold office hours for all of my students, totally free forever. If you've ever invested in one of my courses, I don't care if the course you've taken is $7 or $27 or $77, anything in between, you have automatic access to my courses for, to my magical office hours forever. You can come hang out with my students, ask anything you want about your life, the universe, anything, anything magical, life coaching, all of it. Come and hang out. All right. Um, so next to my session tomorrow, we're going to be moving on to what I call the horizontal dimension. Horizontal dimension is spirit cast down into physical reality, but it doesn't go in a straight line. It kind of searches back and forth and back and forth as we shift through the polarities of our life. Nothing is ever this or that. It's always a constantly moving between this and that, so to speak. And there is no more elegant, sophisticated tool for describing how spirit manifests into physical reality than astrology. So tomorrow we're going to take the first step and we're going to look at uh, what the Corpus Hermeticum called the seven governors and how those seven governors spin out this infinite, infinite space of, of possibilities that we are surrounded in. Okay. So it is my pleasure to have had you all here. I am really glad that we're having this conversation and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. In the meantime, homework. If you've got one of these, any version of tarot decks, get them out. Start a conversation. It doesn't have to be simple. You don't even know how to do a spread. Just pull one card out and say, Hey, hi, I'm here. How can I work with you to open up that deeper conversation within? Pull a card and just look at it. 
just look at it and see how it speaks to you in the moment. Don't even look in the book. You don't even need to look in the book. Just pull a card and say, huh, well, that's interesting. Not sure what you're trying to say. Maybe you can give me a hint. Pull another card and then compare the two together and see what story begins to emerge from the card one to the second card you pull. And just keep having that conversation with the tarot cards as if you were talking to a friend who instead of answering you in words was just answering you in a picture. And keep this conversation going. Well, that's really interesting. Does that relate to this situation? See what it says. And from that first steps into your journey with tarot, I already believe it will help you bring some new spark to your daily life. Okay? All right, everyone. I got to go. I'm 15 minutes over for the day. This is what happens when you ask me questions. It was my pleasure to see you all. Feel free to add any more comments. I will check back in this afternoon. And until tomorrow, I hope your day is filled with magic. Take care, everyone.